No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, the rich old ruler, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Looking at him, Jesus felt the love for him and said to him, Here it is. One thing. Curly said, Only one thing you've got to find. Jesus said, one thing you lack. Go, sell all you possess and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. But at these words, he was saddened and he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. We'll stop there. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, bless the reading of your word today. The things that's going to be said concerning eternal life, serving you. We just praise you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So the rich young ruler comes to Christ and he asks, what can I do to inherit eternal life? So the first thing that I want you to see this morning of only two things is the one thing of eternal life. The one thing that would give a man or a woman eternal life. The rich young ruler had apparently heard about others receiving the gift of salvation. He apparently had known about someone else getting this gift, having this thing. He knew that there was something that he needed to do, I suppose, in order to inherit eternal life. And Jesus is there on the roadside, and this man comes running up to him. Isn't that something? He ran up to Christ. I, I read in that that there was an urgency in this man's life. He ran to Christ. And I'll tell you something, there ought to be an urgency in your life if you are without Christ this morning. If you do not have eternal life, you need to get that settled. There should be an urgency about that. He comes to Christ, especially coming, asking, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I heard Adrian Rogers say one time about living that it's only one life, he said, and it will soon pass, pass, and only the things done for Christ will last. And it's so very true. We need to have an urgency about serving the Lord. There should be an urgency about knowing Him and having eternal life. He ran to Him, the Scripture says in verse 17. And He knelt before Him. And amen to that. There was humility involved in, in the urgency of His life. Humbling yourself is certainly a priority when it comes to the, being in the presence of God. We do not want to run into the presence of God with a, with a proud, haughty attitude. We want to humble ourselves, do we not? And it's not that we have anything or that we have done anything that's worth being in His presence about. It's the fact that we are in the presence of deity. And we ought to humble ourselves just as He did as we speak to Him. Not only did He come with an urgent Need, he ran to him and he humbled himself. <clears throat> but he also said, good teacher, what can I do to inherit eternal life? There was a request involved in this, was there not? Yes. What can I do to inherit eternal life? And I think that's a fair question. What can I do? What could you do this morning and have, that you might have eternal life? I'm asking you this morning if you're going to, if you go out of this building without eternal life, with Christ in your heart, <clears throat> what are you going to do about that? There's an urgency in your life, and you may not even know.
know that there is an urgency there. That one thing that you should be seeking for this morning is eternal life with Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can give it to you. That one thing you see. What must I do to possess eternal life? What can I do to have eternal life? And Jesus, and the story is going to seemingly take a turn here, Jesus says, well, why do you even call me good? And, and, and it's one of those head-scratching things, is it not? Yes, sir. Was it good? Amen. Yes, it was good. Is he good today? Amen. Yes, he's good today. But he asked him, why do you call me good? And then he says, there's only one that's good, and that's the Father. And it seems like that Christ is caught up more in the question than the answer. I do not know why he said what he did, but I know there's a reason behind it. In his mind and heart because of it, he was good. It very well may be that he said that he was pointing to his humanity. But I, I, I kind of get that, but even in his humanity, he was good. He had a perfect life. He's going to live that life. But maybe, maybe he's saying in, 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 in his humanity, I, I'm not good. Only one in heaven is good. And he's also not only fully God, he's fully human. And he knows the man's thoughts. He knows his intent. And he maybe is reading through all the stuff that, that he's coming, trying to get something that he doesn't want. There's only one good, that's God that's in heaven. It very well could be that he's speaking of his humanity and not his deity right now. It very well may be that he was saying, you cannot look on the outside to find good. You have to look on the inside to find good. And it very well may be that he was saying, you want eternal life. It's not found here and now doing stuff. It's found by believing things. And in verse 19, Jesus said to him these words, do do you know the commandments? Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and honor your mother. And it's interesting to me that when he starts mentioning and naming the commandments, he starts past the fourth commandment. And the first four commandments are considered by scholars to be the vertical commandments. In other words, it's the, it's the relationship that a man, a woman has with God. You honor God. You have no other gods before me. It's all vertical. After the fourth one, the fifth through ten, they're all horizontal. It's my relationship with you. It's how we live in and among the world that you and I are living in. But it's all horizontal. And that's exactly what, where Jesus started. And he says, Do you, have you done these things, so to speak? And the man says, I have. I have. I've kept all these from my youth up. Well, when did his youth start? One commentator said it started with him at his bar mitzvah. When he was recognized as being from it, taken from his youth and starting his is uh, is adulthood, so to speak. It's amazing that he puts these things out, and the horizontal position is is brought to front, and the, and the light is, is shining on it. And Jesus gives him the most radical reply. He said, "What I want you to do, and that's that's my term, not his. What I, what, I, what you need to do is forget about your riches, and you need to forget the fact that you are young." And what I really want you to do is give those up and just follow me. And you'll have eternal life. That's part of the doing part, is it not? Now here's a, here's a young, rich, young ruler that has everything that he needed. And he got, he's got riches, he's got youth, everything. And he says, give all that up and follow me. In essence, church, in essence, is that not what you and I are supposed to do? Yes. Not to inherit eternal life, but once we receive eternal life, aren't we supposed to give up some things? Is that not what Peter and James and John and the rest there on the Sea of Galilee was told? If you'll follow me, give up the fishing, give up the nets, give up your occupation, I'll make you fishers of men. Is that not what you and I are supposed to do? Once we 
receive Christ, we're to follow him. You may have kept all the horizontal commandments, but it's the vertical commandments. It's to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. The one thing in relationship, the one thing in eternal life is not what you can do. It is not what you have done. It's what you can possess by trusting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And that's what he was saying. That one thing is not how you act. That one thing is have you received what comes down from above. And I'll remind you of the words of the Lord, and I do this often. You probably get tired of it. Never. But I'll remind you today, and maybe even I may mention it next week too. Who knows? But there's a narrow gate and a narrow way, and few there be that find it. And there's a broad gate and a broad way. And everybody's going through it and down that road Amen. for the most part. It's a gate that leads to destruction. In verse 22, look, he says, but at these words, he was saddened that he had to give up something to follow Christ. And he went away grieving <clears throat> or he had much property. And he turns and walks away. Well, if we could bring him up here today and have him stand here on the platform, he would probably say, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Which is exactly what I did. He would probably say something like that. Do you know the one thing that gives life meaning it is a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and giving up your riches, so to speak, and giving up your youth and giving up everything and following Him and making Him not the Savior of your life, but the Lord of your life. Amen. That's what that point's all about. The story continues over in the 10th chapter of Luke's Gospel. <laughs> and so if you'll turn there, we'll read Verses 38 through 42 together. You, don't, you will not have to stand this time. And it's the most familiar story of, of three close friends of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Now listen. Verse 38 says, Now as, he, as they were traveling along, he entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. This wasn't the first time he'd been there. <clears throat> she had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. You see, we kind of come into the middle of the story here, did we not? Martha was distracted with all her preparations. And she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then he said, then tell her to help. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. Now watch this. But only, Curly, what is the one thing that makes life worth living? <clears throat> Jesus says to her, Jesus said to the rich young ruler, only one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Interesting, is it not? The one thing about ser <clears throat> serving the Lord the one thing about eternal life and the one thing about serving, the one thing that wants eternal life comes into the heart. Now, now it's time for discipleship, is it not? That's what we're talking about. So, so we move from the roadside to the inside. We move from a story that took place outside to a story that's taking place on the inside of a home. From the rich young ruler who did not know the master when he left, 
to three people who were friends where Christ often came and stopped and rested and enjoyed their company. On this occasion, folks had gathered. Now we pick up in kind of the middle of the story, but let's let's just kind of bring it up to up to snuff here, so to speak. Here it is. Jesus and the disciples have stopped by. They're at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And Mary and Lazarus and Jesus and others from the village have gathered in their home. There's got to be more than just the three there. And Christ is in another room teaching and talking and mentoring. I don't think this was a formal thing. I think this was a very informal thing. And Mary is in another room preparing lunch. Is she not? Is that right? She's preparing a meal of some sort. Something that, that everyone can have a bit of. Mary has chosen a place because I'm thinking the room is crowded at the very feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Martha, whose gift is serving is fixing and doing what she in her heart loves to do for other people. She's a servant. She loves to entertain. She loves to provide and, and honor guests. And so while she's in there and the, the, I'm thinking they're getting close to the time for a meal to be served and she's not quite ready. Now, would you let me Use my imagination here a bit. Something sets her off, Martha. Could it be that, and I, I mentioned a moment ago that this was an informal setting, could it be, what would be the one thing that if you were out working and you were preparing and you're not quite ready, that would that would just maybe set you off? I, I think maybe Christ has said something humorous and everybody's laughing and having fun. Are grinning or chuckling a bit. Now you don't you don't picture Christ like that. But all of a sudden, I'm thinking Mary hears a little laughter, something lighthearted, and she has had all she can take of this. Wouldn't that be kind of the straw to break the back of the castle? <laughs> Whatever it was, she burst through the door and she unloads on Jesus. And I, I I'm using that term. I think that's what she did. She's, she's agitated. Would you tell her to come help me? You're going to be through and Lazarus is going to holler, let's eat here in just a minute. And I'm not ready and she won't help me. It's her fault. <laughs> and Christ says to her, Martha, call the name Christ, Martha. Martha, you are what? You are weighted down about things that does not make that much difference yeah. in eternity. Amen. It's important now, and this is your gift, but in eternity, Mary has chosen the best right now. She's sitting and listening and absorbing. She's listening and loving, and she's trying to learn some things. Jesus says to her in verse 41, Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered about so many things. And Mary's doing what? She's just listening, and she's learning, and she's loving. She, my, my words, she has found that one thing that really matters most. She's found that one thing that really matters most. Now, I'm going to tell you something, church. I think most of us, if not all of us, are more like Martha than we are Mary. And there's nothing wrong with that. We, we need the Marthas, don't we? But here, here's what I want to tell you this morning. <clears throat> Service before worship 
becomes duty. Now listen to what I just said. Service before worship becomes duty, burdensome. We need to be quiet. We need to worship. And then, and then we can go out and do what? Serve from a heart of love. We get this thing all backwards, do we not? Listen, most of us are so burdened down that we can't get anything done right. Most of us are burdened down with what? Right now, we're burdened down with the demands of the season. Are we not? We're burdened down with stress from family members. We're burdened down with stress from work. We're burdened down with this and we're burdened down with that. And I'm going to say this because we're not here. We have people this morning, in my opinion, that are not here because they were just too tired to get up and come to church. Mm -hmm. Aren't you glad you're here today? Amen. <laughs> you got a big pat on the back, didn't you? <laughs> well, are you here for the right reason? Are you here out of duty? Are you here to worship? Amen. It's, it, it, it isn't. That's what I'm talking about. Some of the reasons is we serve before we worship. And when we serve before we worship, it becomes a duty, not a devotion. And it's a common practice. It's a common mistake. And, and especially at the Christ, in the Christian's life and at the Christmas season, we think that doing equals the, as it, or is as important as worship. Do, you not, do we not think that? That doing things is more important or is equally as important as worship. Therefore, when we do and do and do, and we worship once or whatever, we're burned out the time we get out the door. Amen. It's not fun anymore. We have to worship first. When we worship first, the doing falls into line because of a loving heart that wants to serve the master. What I'm talking about. Preach. He wants you. God does. He wants me listening and learning and loving before we go out and live for him. Yes. He wants that. Martha was distracted. I have some, some questions about her, Martha. Was her service commendable? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Was her devotion admirable? Yes. Yeah, I think so too. Yes. Was her frustration understandable? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, yes to all those myself. Her service was commendable. Her devotion was was uh, admirable and her frustration was understandable. Because, because it's noon and she's not finished or whatever time it was and they were going to be ready to eat and it was not going to be ready for some time. And I won't have it done and Mary it's your fault. <laughs> she should have been helping. Another question I'll pose to you. I'll go make a statement, but I'll just ask a question. Do you think that Martha and Mary equally love Jesus? Yes. 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 I do too. I, I, I do. Martha loves giving herself to him and to others. And Mary loves Martha loves doing and Mary loves being. Being in his presence. But both are commendable and both are needed. Is that not the picture of the church today? But we've got the thing backwards. Let's do and do and do and then let's run the other worship. Well, let's worship, worship, worship and let's go out and do. Amen. Let's be in his presence. Let's do it tomorrow. And let's do it through the week. And then we'll serve out the heart filled with love yes. for what he has done for us. If you worship, 
your service will not be a duty, it will be a delight. If you worship, your service will not burn you out, it will light you up. If you're distracted today, and you're confused, and the focus is not on what it should be, Martha will surely focus on what? Lunch. Or dinner, whatever. Now listen, I don't say this to those, I know many of you are servers, I get that. But Martha was focused on serving, and Mary was focused on Jesus. And both love you deeply. Now, here we are, just a few days away from Christmas. By the way, we'll have a Christmas service here on Christmas Day at 11 o'clock. But it is Christmas. And, and he's come into this world that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Amen? Amen. We, listen, we need to be like the rich young ruler and run to him. There's an urgency about worship, is there not? Yes. There is. And we need to, when we get into his presence, we need to die to self. <coughs> and we need to be more like him so that we can follow him. Yes. More dedicated. Lord, this Christmas, I'm dying to my riches. Lord, this Christmas, I am dying to my youth. Lord, today, I'm going to be alive only to you and to your Lordship. And Lord, whether we eat lunch or not, and some of you are thinking more about lunch right now than you are Christ. <laughs> But Lord, whether we eat lunch or not, the one thing I want to do is be with you and in your presence. Amen. You deserve worship and service. You know the shepherds were in the fields, and you remember the, the sequence of things that happened? They first saw, they saw the glory of the Lord shining. Man. They heard the angel as he spoke to them. They went to see this thing that they, they had been told about, about the coming of Christ. And then they went out and told what they had seen. And that's, that's, the, that's the sequence. That's the order of things. They heard the good news. They went to see and they went and told what they had seen. That's what Christmas is. That's discovery, church. The one thing